church of Laodicea. So turn with me to the book of Revelation, which is your last book in the Bible. And let's go to chapter 3. We're going to read once again uh, about this seventh church. This is really part two of what we studied last week. So what we're doing is we're going to finish up what we studied last week. Okay, so uh, let's go to verses 14 through 22. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, the last church in these seven churches, verse 14 through 22. And then we're going to do a little recap of what we studied last week. And then we're going to finish up tonight with this seventh church. Okay, verse 14 through 22, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it reads, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich. You have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens uh, the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who, who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Now, uh, on your outline, we have already went over page one. So we're not going to go over page one again. We went over page one. But, well, the bottom of page one. So we're going to start at the bottom of page one, which is the concern. The concern, which is verse 15 through 17. The concern. 15 through 17. Josh, did you give me my water? Please, is in the back. Thank you so much. Uh, the concern. Let me turn this up a little bit. Thank you. All right. The concern, which is page, oh, page one, but we're going to read verse 15 through 17 again. And it reads as follows. 15, just 15 through 17. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, uh, poor, blind, and naked. Stop right there. Look at your outline, bottom of page one, the concern. This is the concern. We know so far that this is the last church and that out of, out of the seven churches, Christ always had something good to say about each church. This is the only church he didn't have anything good to say about at all. And remember, when we talk about the seven churches, the seven churches represents two, two types of things. It represents church history um, from the time Jesus died on the cross all the way until the rapture. It represents different periods of church age, but it also represents the type of churches that we have today. So this church is called the lukewarm church. We already explained all the other churches when we study them. This church is called the lukewarm church. We're about to find out why this church is called the lukewarm church. So uh, just remember when we're studying this, that this is a rep representation of the kinds of churches in this country. Not in the country, but in the world. We want to um, understand as we study 
do we have any lukewarm churches in this country, in the world? Are we a lukewarm church? Have we been in lukewarm churches? And what is a lukewarm church? Church. We already studied the Philadelphia church. We knew what kind of church it was. We knew that it was a faithful church. We knew about the uh, Ephesian church, the first church, that it was, it was a church that lost its first love, but they started off good. We knew about all the other churches. This last church is a lukewarm church. Last week we stated this, so if you didn't know, the lukewarm church is an unsaved church. If there's such a thing, just let you know there is such a thing. As an unsaved church, meaning the majority, not saying all of them, but the majority of the people that go to that church are not saved. How do you know that? Well, he's going to say it right here. We're going to get to the concern. We're going to find out how we know a church is a lukewarm church. Notice what he said about the lukewarm church in the verse, because this is very key. The reason he calls them lukewarm because he said they were neither cold nor hot. Anybody like drinking lukewarm water? He says, it don't taste good if you really look at it. But see, the lukewarm that Jesus was talking about was a little different from the lukewarm water that we drink today. The lukewarm water that Jesus was talking about, he was using the city of Laodicea and their water system as an example. The city of Laodicea had a very poor water supply. In other words, they were drinking really dirty water. And it was lukewarm. So Jesus said, just like that water is nasty to y'all, that's how you are to me. That's God, that God, God always used the church Uh, whatever they were going through, whatever city, as an example. He used their own characteristics of their city against them and said, just like you don't like lukewarm water, I don't like lukewarm people. Because lukewarm people are unsaved people. Just remember that. Lukewarm people are unsaved people. I'm going to tell you what a hot person is and what a cold person is. We're going to talk about that too. So let's look at part A, page one deeds. I know your works. I know your deeds. We said this last week about the deeds. Deeds always, your works, what you do, always reveal people's true spiritual state. You can't tell me that you are, uh, you love Jesus and you like killing people. You just can't tell me you love Jesus. I'm saved. But every now and then, if you get me mad, I'm going to I'm gonna have to take you out of here. No, see that? You can't be saved and you're a murderer. And now I'm not saying a Christian won't ever commit murder. But you can't say that you were saved and you like the act of killing people. Tell me you're Jeffrey Dahmer's or, or somebody. No, he's telling me he knows Jesus. Not, not before he was doing all that, he didn't. But he said he accepted Christ while he was in prison. That could be true. That could be true after the fact. But watch this. So your deeds reveal your true spiritual state. Now, we got to be careful. I see your hand. We got to be careful about the deeds because we always want the deeds to line up with the deeds of what? The Bible. You always want to keep the deeds lined up with the deeds of the Bible. So when you see a person not lining up willfully and don't care about what the Bible says about deeds, that's the person you got to watch out for and say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, uh, here is something God clearly says don't do. Now you're telling me you're going to do it and you don't care what God's word says. He says that reveals to you the kind of person you just saw. Police officers. Yes. Now, yeah, when we talk about certain, that's why I said we got to go with the deeds of what? The Bible. Uh, The 14th chapter of Romans says this, that God ordains nations. God ordains authority, meaning this. He has given the police officer or anybody authority to keep what? Control. 
So if, if it's in the scripture, then for somebody to go against a police officer or a military person and somebody who took an oath like a military person who's fighting in Iraq and Iran, they took an oath to protect our country, then God sanctions that. So you got to find it in the scripture because you do have some churches that are against uh, Christians going to war or against young people signing up for the military. They are against it. Oh, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. He's talking about what? What kind of killing do you think he's talking about? He says, thou shalt not kill. Yeah, heinous, uh, uh, what do they call those crimes? Um, uh, those hate crimes, selfless, selfish, uh, hatred crimes, those type of killings. You break, I, I'm going to your house to rob you. Now, you have a weapon. So you're thinking more than just robbing me, because if I catch you, you're going to use your weapon against me unless I use mine against you first. And I will be, guess what? I'll be right in God's eyesight, because if my wife and children are in the home, I'm the protector of the house. So if you lose your life because you came in my house and you didn't think I had a weapon in my house, so surprise, surprise. And you're going to meet Jesus, and then we're going to pray for you after. And I'll come, I'll, R.A. Vernon says, and I'll come and hoop at your funeral, too. I, I'll preach your funeral and hoop at it, too. Don't think, Christians, we all supposed, oh, we supposed to be. You don't let folks walk in your house and destroy your family. You don't do that. You are the husband, if you're, if you're a husband and wife, you are the protector of the home. If you're a single person, you have the right to protect yourself in your home. That's just the law. Right, right. So they had the interpretation, right? They'll kill a Gentile. You won't get in trouble for killing a Gentile, but don't kill a Jew or you're going to go to jail. So, right, remember, so when we talk about deeds, always remember this. He says, I know your deeds, the deeds that are against who? God. So I said, once again, there are dead or, or churches that are lukewarm, unsaved churches. So let me give you an example of one. Here's a pastor who ordains uh, 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 same sex to come to his church and he will marry them. That's a dead, lukewarm church. Because guess what? What does God's word say about uh, same sex marriage? Don't do it. That's what he says. So any pastor that goes against that then and, and teaches his members to do that and they all in agreement with him, then... That is a church that is lukewarm. Now watch what he says. He says this. Now let's look at some scriptures that go uh, back this up. We don't have to look at Matthew 7, 1, but I do want to look at Romans 2, 6 through 8. Amazing, amazing scripture about your deeds, your works. Romans 2. And then somebody who has, who's quick with their Bible, go to James 2, 14. I'm going to read Romans 2, 6 through 8. Somebody else read James 2, 14. Let me read my first. Of course, you know, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Romans uh, 2, 6 through 8. Let's, let's read that one. It says, who will render to each one according to his deeds, talking about that's Christ, eternal life to those who by patient uh, continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. He says, the one who does good deeds want to do what? They want to seek out the honor. They want to seek out the immortality. They want to seek after eternal life. But the guy who don't want to do right, he want to seek after what? Wrath and indignation. I'm going to talk something about wrath in a minute to show you uh, some people ask the question, why does all this stuff happen in the world? Why people are dying and getting killed? Uh, and just want to let you know, this is called the wrath of God. God's wrath is, is broken up into two different parts. The first and number one way God pours out his wrath is, number one, by you, by allowing you to suffer the consequences of your own actions. Did you know that is part of the wrath of God? That you suffer the actions, uh, or consequences of your own actions. Uh, so, in other words, if I 
if I rob the store, once again, if I rob the store and I'm trying to run away, I don't care if I'm 16, 13, 12, I run away, the owner, because he didn't know if I had a weapon or it was a BB gun, but he didn't know that. He shoots me, and I have to lose my leg. Oh, look at the poor little boy. He got one leg. No, he's suffering the consequences of his own actions. That's called the wrath of God. You can't feel sorry for people that was doing something that they had no business doing, and they suffer the consequences. Here's another consequence. My consequences may affect my wife. It may affect my son. If I cheated on my wife, I've been married 21 years, I decided, okay, uh, I want somebody new. But I ain't tell her that. I ain't tell her. I'm going to get somebody new on the side. She don't know. So I've got somebody new on the side, and I contract a sexually transmitted disease called HIV. I come home and I pass that disease down to her. Guess what? I just not my consequence. It wasn't her fault. She gonna die just like me. We both gonna die from HIV. But guess what? Who should feel all the guilt? It's gonna be me. But see, I'm not gonna die from HIV because she gonna kill me before I die from HIV. Y'all gonna be reading about me on the news. Yeah, they, that was that good looking couple. That was it. No, she took him out of here because she found out. She, he was gone. So anyway, but that, uh, my consequences has affected not only him. Now, watch this. She done killed me. She went to jail. Now, he 13. Guess where he going? He going to foster care. We just messed up everybody's life. All, but who, 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 it was my fault. The wrath of God is now the consequences of my one action. It's a triple effect. Guess what? It just come on down. It just trickles on down to the rest of the family. My mama going to be over here hurting. Right? Because she's like, I told that. You know, she, <laughs> now, she might be out there. <laughs> so it's just a whole big, all because of what? My action. So the wrath of God can start there. Yes, sir. No, it's just already set in motion. He already set it in motion that whatever you do, you reap the consequences of what you do. That is his wrath. Now, you can ask for forgiveness. I could ask the Lord, forgive me for uh, cheating on my wife. He'll forgive me, but I still got HIV. And she's still going to prison for killing me. When she, she asked God, Lord, forgive me, but I'm taking him out of here. She's still going to do life. He's still going to foster care. That all this, it doesn't change a fact because God loves me and forgave me. It doesn't change the fact that you got to reap what you sow. Every deed, watch this, heard a preacher say, every deed is a seed. Every deed is a seed. Whatever you do, you plant in the seed. Whatever you do, it's going to grow up. It might not catch you right then, but guess what? Your sins will find you out. That's what the scriptures would say. It says that. So, yeah, every deed is a seed. Just remember that. Now, who has James 2.14? Uh, yes, Sister Eli, I'm going to read it for us. Hold on, because we got to hear it. It's from the King James Version. What doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Oh, that's a good question. James asked the question, if a man says he has faith, but don't have deeds to back up his faith, does he really have faith? Can his, that type of faith save him? So watch this. There are different types of faith. There is a type of faith, the one in James 2.14, and that's, I'm going to tell you what that kind of faith is. A person who says he's saved, but don't act like he's saved. That's a faith. That's a type of faith. He says he's saved. It's coming out of his mouth. I'm saved. I'm saved. I love Jesus. I accepted him. But when you look at his life, he don't change. So he says, can that faith save him? No, it cannot. That's the kind of faith this last church had. They were the type of people that boasted about being with God. But guess what they didn't have? No action. No deeds to back up the action. You could tell me you're the greatest singer in the world. Y'all watch American Idol. Where, that X Factor show coming out in a minute. All the people that, that's going to be on the X Factor, the new show, singing show, they, everybody, they're going to swear 
that they can sing. They're going to tell you, I got faith, I can sing, I should be the next star. And when you hear them, you're going to like, oh, Lord, you, you, should, you should still stay, keep your day job. Don't, do not quit your job. <laughs> but some people really believe that they have, they can do a certain thing, but when you actually hear them, they can't back it up. They can't back it up with the action. You have to back everything you say up with what? Action. The phrase, the old cliche that we hear all the time, action speaks louder than words. I can tell my wife I love her all I want to. She can ask me to take out the garbage and I'm like, would you? No, you take out the garbage. I can, so if, if, if I'm telling her I love her, I got to do more than just tell her. I got to do what? I got to show. I got to show it. Because just the talking is not enough. You know, because you think, you know, I've been married 21 years. You would think after 21 years, the wife would get used to getting flowers and cards. Okay, we passed that stage. That's the first, you know, when you dating somebody, you buy them cards and stuff. You know, every year she still wants some flowers and she wants some cards. 21 years later, let me miss her. Let me miss a, a, a birthday. Let me miss an anniversary. I don't care how long we've been married. She still want her car. She still wants to go out. She still wants to be treated nice. It never dies out. Just because we're together and we spend our money together and we started this family and we did, all that has nothing if you don't show some love in your relationships. And God is the same way. God says, listen, you can tell me you saved all you want to, but if you don't show me that you are dedicated to me, I can't believe you. Watch what he says. That was James 2, 14. That was good. Part B, he says, neither cold nor hot. The church of Laodicea had a poor water supply. We read about that. But watch that last sentence. Some churches make the Lord weep. Some churches make the Lord angry. And some churches, it's at the bottom, make the Lord sick. He says, you make me sick. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, God, turn on the page two, God doesn't want a lukewarm person, which is an unsafe person. He wants you either what? Cold or hot. So let's see what cold or hot is. Turn to page two, the top of page two says hot people. What is a hot person? Not a person that looks good. I know, I know that's just, you know, she hot. He hot. No, he's he not talking like that. God is saying you hot. Watch what he said. Hot people are those who are spiritually alive. And possess the fervency of a transformed life. A person who God considers hot is a person who lives out what he says. If you say you saved, then you're showing me that you're saved by what? Your actions. That's a hot person. Let's see what a cold person is. A cold person. Cold people are those who are spiritually what? Dead like a dead, cold body. These are those who reject Christ. Uh, it's almost like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said this. It's a very, very amazing statement he made about uh, cold people. Let me just tell you what cold people. Cold people are unsaved people. But the unsaved people that tell you they unsaved, they tell you, I don't like God. I don't want to be on God's side. Don't tell me about Jesus. I want to hear that Jesus stuff. Good, they close the door. And you know them. That's the cold person. But the lukewarm person, you don't know if they like God or not because they try to tell you that they they love God. But when you watch their life, it don't line up with what they're saying. That's what's happening. So either you got to be hot, you are for God, or you're going to be cold. You don't, everybody know it. You don't, you just reject them. Martin Luther King made a statement about uh, atheists or uh, people like to talk about people who are atheists. You know, you got some people who are, he said, who are atheists theoretically. And theoretically means they say it with their mouth that I'm an atheist. I don't believe there is a God. But that's not the worst kind of atheist. The worst kind of atheist is the one who live like there is no God. Because he says there's a whole bunch of church folks in here. But you say you love God with your lips. But your life, you're saying that you don't even know him. That's atheistic. And that's, that's atheism. Living like you don't know God. What's a person that lives like God? A person that, that doesn't line up with the word of God. Uh, so we have to remember that. Practicing 
atheism. So that's what a lukewarm person, a cold person is. Look at C, lukewarm. Lukewarm people, these are they that are not really saved, but they have not openly rejected Christ. They are they not they won't tell you they don't love God. They're going to show you that they, love, they don't love God, but they telling you out of their mouth, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. I've been baptized. I, I, I pay my tithes. I do this. I feed the hungry. They tell you all that, but when you look at their lifestyle, it doesn't match up with the lifestyle. It just, it, with the word of God. Uh, I gave you the example of the, the, the same-sex couple. I can give you the example of a couple that's living together. I can give you an example of somebody committing adultery who tried to justify uh, the, the act. Let me give you a perfect example. You, anybody know Pat Robinson? Y'all heard of Pat Robinson? I don't know if you heard what he lately, I think he's his old age setting in. He made a statement this past week. Somebody called in on his program. He has the 700 Club show. Somebody called in this show earlier this week, and the older gentleman said his wife had dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, and that she doesn't recognize him anymore. They've been married 40 years, and she doesn't recognize him anymore, and he feels that he should divorce his wife, who has dementia, and because he said, I need love, too. I'm going to divorce my wife. And go find another woman so I can have some companionship. You know what Pat Robinson told him? He, like, he said, I think that's a good idea. You know, she, she, he said, yeah, that, that, that's a good idea because she really, she's the living dead. She don't know you anymore because she thinks you're probably her brother. So it's all right to go ahead and divorce her and go find somebody else. Now, this man is a well-known preacher for the past 40 years. You know, he ran for president one time, didn't win. But that statement was a wrong statement for the fact of he made vows at the altar that says for better or for worse through sickness and through health that's what he said till death do us party you know i test my wife all the time i tested through 21 years like if i if i blew up and if i got burnt up in the car my body 90 percent of my body burnt up on the wheelchair you ain't gonna leave me are you she thought about it like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, she said, I'll take care of you. I, I'll take care of you. And would I do the same thing? She said, would you do the same thing? If something happened where well, I lost all my hair, I got, would you, if you're looking at my body and only married me for my body, then you wouldn't last in this marriage. You wouldn't because when I get sick, you got to be there. And if I got sick, she had to be there. You didn't say you was going to stay with me because I can walk. And then if I lost my, my ability to walk and you got to push me around in a wheelchair, oh, no, I can't handle this. I'm, I got to go. You on your own, put you in the home, and uh, I'm going to marry Johnny down the street. No, see, people have done that. And his mouth ain't lining up with the way he looked like. Now, if you can get past that stage and you can form a relationship past the talking and the looks, then you've got a halfway chance. But once you start finding out their what? Their ways, how they deal with money. How they deal with situations. My wife always tell me, she said, her mother told her, this is how you can tell if you have a good husband. Uh, watch how he treats his mother and his sister. You'll know what kind of man you have, how he treats his own mother and sister. Because if he could treat them very well, then he's going to treat you real well. Then that's true. That's, that's true. So you got to understand that there's things you can look at to find out what kind of person you have. And you can't tell me, I didn't know he was going to beat me when we got, yes, you did, because he was halfway about to hit you when y'all was dating. And he threatened to hit you, girl. You say, say it one more time. Say, well, you know I'm going to hit you. And you know that. And then when you got married, you thought it was going to stop because he married you. And it don't stop. It gets worse. So once again, they give you these signs. I don't know why you're talking about this, but we're going to go on. Let's go finish. <laughs> We got we to gotta finish the church of Laodicea. But we were talking about that because of what? Lukewarmness and showing you what? The signs that people show you their what? Their deeds. They're going to show you. Watch what he says of the lukewarm. They go to church 
and they claim that they are saved. Examples are who? The Pharisees. And you can read those when you, when you get home. The tax collectors, and this is what Jesus said, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will make it into heaven before you guys do. Meaning what? The prostitutes, when they find out that they were in the wrong, what did they do? They automatically changed. And they began to line up with God. When the tax collector who was overcharging people their taxes, when he found out that what he was doing was wrong, he changed. But these Pharisees, these religious folks, they didn't change. They just put on a better robe. They sung a better choir song. They didn't change at all. God is looking for change. He's don't, he don't care what the outward man looks like. He don't care about your church traditions. He cares about what? Change. If you don't change, then... Uh, you really haven't changed. One preacher, I think it was Creflo Dollar, said change is not change until you change. That's what real change is. And that's that's a true statement. Watch what he says in number six. The command. Oh, no, the D. You say that you are. Remember, they said they were rich. They said that they uh, had money. They said that they had all these clothes. They got gold. And he says, you say that you are. They were just like the rich young ruler. Let's look at him because we have to see this rich young ruler because the church of Laodicea said they were rich. Let's go to Matthew 19. This is very, this is real interesting. The rich young ruler. And I heard preachers preach on this and some of it got it wrong. And let me see if you think the same way. Matthew 19, 16 through 22. Listen to this. You would think this guy was very sincere. Matthew 19, he was rich. So God is not against anybody having money. Remember that. God is never against you having money. You can have money. As a matter of fact, all your wealth belongs to him anyway. God wants you to have money. He wants you to have more than enough. Don't ever think he's ever against that. So watch this. Verse 16, rich young ruler. He says this. Now behold, I'll read from 16 through uh, 22. And he says, now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher. He's talking about Jesus, talking to Jesus. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Stop right there. He says, what Jesus, Jesus, I heard your teaching and everything. What should I do to have eternal life? Okay, Jesus, that's a good question. So he said to him, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is good. God. But if you want to enter into what life, keep the commandments. That's what Jesus told them. You know, remember, before Jesus died on the cross, they are still living where? Under the law. So he said, keep the Ten Commandments. Keep the commandments. He said, okay. Watch what the young man says. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? So he tried to tell Jesus, I kept all the commandments. I could, I've been keeping the commandments since I was a little boy. He said, he said, Jesus, show me. What else do I lack? Watch what Jesus, he's going to tell him what he's lacking. Uh, verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Well, wait a minute. Jesus said, go sell every, everything. He didn't say half of it. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor and then come follow me. And watch what, watch what his reaction was. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Did he get saved? No. He walked away. Now, wait a minute. This is a young man that said he kept all the Ten Commandments. This is a young man that said, I've been doing all the stuff God told me to do from my youth up. But he still didn't get saved. Why not? Well, what was the problem? Verse 21. Jesus told him to do what? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. It wasn't the fact that he was telling him to give all his money away. What did you think Jesus was trying to get him to do? And do what? And what? Rely on him. Right? Did you know those 12 disciples? 
that was following him around for three and a half years was relying on Jesus for their own life. They didn't know what they were going to eat the next day. They didn't know where they was going to sleep the next day for those three and a half years when they following Jesus around. They even left their families for those three years. They didn't take their families with them. They followed Jesus in the ministry and Jesus took care of them financially and fed them physically. He's telling the young man, give all you have. If you really want to be saved, you got to deny yourself and come and follow me. Give it all up and follow me. He's like, I can't do that. And that's what people are doing today. When God says, give everything up in the world and follow me, then that's what true salvation is. True salvation is doing what? Giving everything up. Okay, God says, in order for me to get to heaven, I got to give up this. No, I ain't giving that up. Then you don't have heaven. It's either going to be that or heaven. What, what thing is keeping you between heaven and your whatever thing that you want to put before God? He says, don't do that. Give everything. So denying yourself doesn't mean to empty out your bank account. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what? Denying yourself of all what the world wants you to do and do what? Follow him. So whatever the world is telling you to do, you got to find out in the Bible if it's right to do. If it's not right to do, don't follow the world. Get rid of it and follow him. So what he's saying is here, this church of Laodicea who says they were rich didn't do what, they did exactly what the rich man did. They wouldn't what? Give up the richness and it was a false richness to follow Christ. As a matter of fact, they said they were rich and they said they were the best church of, of all. The, the richest church right now, the richest church in the world uh, or denomination is the Catholic Church. A lot of people didn't know that. Uh, the Catholic Church is the richest church in the world. But they have some real false doctrines that are out of this world. And they do some crazy stuff that is out of the world that don't even line up with the word of God. But yet they will boast about we're the richest church in the world. We have the most members than any other denomination. And they probably do. But guess what? That doesn't mean that they're right. You've got to give up everything to follow Christ. Watch what he says here. He goes on and give them a command. The command is found in verse 18 through 20. But watch this. Let's read it. We'll go back to Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 18. So here's the command. He wants them to do an exchange. And I want to show you this because a lot of people thought that he was talking about money, exchanging money, but he really wasn't. Verse 18. Uh, I counsel you to buy, underline that word, buy. Verse 18, I counsel you. So here's the counsel. I counsel you, or the command, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed uh, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many, uh, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Look on your outline, the command. Christ offers three things to them to buy. Now, I want to explain to buy. When Jesus says, come to me and buy, the word buy means exchange. In other words, when you buy something at the store, when you, no matter what you buy, you, what you're really doing is just exchanging. You're going from one hand to the other. I want your merchandise. I'm going to give you a certain amount of money for your merchandise. So I put that in your hand and you put the merchandise in my hand. That's called exchange. So Jesus was not talking about money when he says buy. He wants them to do what? Exchange. I want you to exchange your gold for what? My gold. I want you to exchange your clothes for my clothes. I want you to exchange, the third one, your spirit, your sight for my spiritual sight. Now, let's find out what the gold is. Verse uh, number one of your line, spiritual gold. It's refined by fire. Your faith, the spiritual gold is your faith. He wanted them to get real faith. Get rid of your, your material gold and take on my gold, which is what? Real faith. Gold. So, uh, let's look at First Peter. Uh, one seven. 
It's going to tell you what your faith is like. That's what real faith is. First Peter 1 and 7. Real faith is like gold. Uh, 1 and 7. He says this. And verse 7. That, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Your gold, your faith is more precious than gold. Did you know that gold today is still the highest commodity today? It's still the highest. You can buy gold today. They tell you to invest in gold even today more than you invest in anything else because gold never what? It don't depreciate. As a matter of fact, it always increases in value. The more you have, the more value valuable it is. But you know what we do with gold? We put, we put it on our necks. Put it on our cars. Put it on our hands, feet. You know, we don't put it in. We don't try to invest in it. It is still the highest commodity. But he says, guess what? What's more precious than gold? Your faith. Your faith in God is the highest commodity there is. What kind of faith do we have? We're supposed to have faith that uh, shows the world that we believe God. It says, second thing you got to give up or exchange. Your clothes for my spiritual clothes. What's Christ's spiritual clothes? He says right here, white garments. The Laodicean people love to wear black clothes. You got to find that out in the history of that church. They love to wear black clothes. And black wool. But Jesus' garment, which is found in Revelation 19, 8, don't turn to it, says this. When we all get to heaven, we will be clothed in white garments. Let me ask you a question. What does white represent? Purity. Holiness. So guess what? You're going to exchange your clothes, your uh, designer jeans, your designer clothes that people think and killing each other over, your designer glasses, your material clothing, you're going to exchange that for his clothing, which is purity and holiness. That's if you're born again. You already, listen to this, you're already pure. You're already holy in Christ. Your, your body got to catch up with your spirit because your spirit is already holy and pure, but your body is not. That's why you got to renew your mind every day with the word of God. That's why it's good to stay prayerful. That's why you got to study the show yourself approved because your body is trying to catch up with what your spirit is already realizing. And that is your spirit man is pure. Your spirit man is holy. But one day your body is going to catch up with your spirit because guess what? You're going to get a brand new body. And your new body that you're going to get, it is going to be pure and it's going to be holy. And on top of that, he's going to clothe it with what? A white garment. You know, we're going we're gonna to wear white robes. We're going to have crowns on. We are going to wear white in heaven, which represents God's holiness. Watch what he says, number three. They said they could see. He said, y'all blind. Y'all can't see anything. I want you to exchange your sight for my sight. And what is God's spiritual sight? Blindness represents lack of understanding and spiritual truth. They needed sight. And here's the sight that he's talking about. When we study the word, the reason we study verse by verse is because we are tired of people taking the scriptures out of context. Because when you read the Bible in context, it makes much more sense. I can take out, I can take a verse one verse out of the Bible and come up whatever sermon I want to come up with and it doesn't have to work it doesn't have to mean anything what that what that verse is talking about. I'll give you a perfect example. The scripture says when Jesus rose up from the grave, before he rose up from the grave, the angel rolled the stone away from the tomb, right? Remember the angel rolled up that's what that's one verse. The angel rolled away the stone from the tomb. But my sermon ain't gonna be about the angel rolling away from the stone from the tomb. This is gonna be my sermon. Rolling away the stones in your life. Roll away the stone of doubt. Roll away the stone of fear. I I don't even have to mention about the angel really rolling away the stone 
uh, from the tomb. I ain't got to mention that at all because my six point sermon going to be roll away. This, and that's pretty good. But let me mention the real context first. Let me tell you what the angel really did and why he rolled away the stone first. Then I can go into roll away the stone of doubt. Roll, but if you never get the real context, then you would never do it. I didn't read all that in there. I, they ain't rolled away fear. Roll away. He just said the angel rolled away the stone. I mean, I heard all kinds of sermons taken out of context from one verse. You can't do that. And if you're not a student of the Bible, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what the preacher is saying. That's why the Bible tells you to study, to show yourself approved. You shouting and running around the church, and he could be test the line. You don't even know what he's saying. Because he took that one verse and took it out of context. It was one, it was one verse, and I heard a preacher say, I'm not going to mention his name because you, you know him. If I mention his name, you'll know him. But he took a verse out of the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastics, because I always get that word wrong. He says this. There's a verse in... That book that says, money answers all problems. Money, it says just like this, in King James Version, money answers all problems. So he says this, that's why you got to be rich. That's why you're going to have some money. You got to have money. You know, you got to give me some too, but you're going to have some money because money answers all problems. But what he didn't do, he didn't read the whole context of that chapter, which was really talking about the kings in that day who thought that they can take their money and solve problems by uh, their money and paying other uh, people off to get their sins covered. That's what the whole chapter was about. But he just pulled that one verse out and preached on money, how money solves all your problems. But guess what? Money don't solve all your problems. Because I know some rich folks that killed themselves. We know some rich folks that got addicted to drugs. With all the money backing them up, they still got divorced. With all the money backing them up, they still couldn't keep their kids. Money don't solve all problems. That is the, it don't buy you love. It can't buy you peace. If, if money solve all problems, the drug dealer should be the first one jumping up and shouting. They don't want to look behind their back, Eric, because they don't know how long they're going to live. Because you always got somebody else who think they're bigger and better than you and going to take over your... T you always got that. So they always walking around with this fear. Either I'm going, I got fear that I'm going to get caught and go to jail. Or I got fear that this other guy going to kill me for what I have. So that can't... That don't solve that problem. So out of context, we study verse by verse. This is called spiritual sight. Because we don't want to take the scriptures out of context. We want to put them in total context so you can learn what the Bible is actually saying. That's very hard to do in this society today. Because in this society today, we want a, uh, what we call a, a good feeling sermon, an easy sermon, one verse, and tell me how to be happy, and tell me how to be rich, and tell me how to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that's not what the scripture's saying. The scripture's really teaching you how to live right. How you're supposed to put your faith first. How you're supposed to put who's first? God first. We preached on Sunday. It's not about us. It's about who? Jesus. I'm going to take the casserole. <laughs> But it's good for them. Here's another thing, a scripture that we really have to talk about all the time, and we should use when we talk about verse by verse. The scripture says this in 2 Timothy, I think, 3, that all scripture is given for what? Or is inspired by God, right? All scripture is inspired by God. But I got a problem because uh, how come preachers don't preach all scriptures? They pre How come you could? I went to, a, I'm telling you, this was 20 years ago. It was, it was really funny. I went to another church. I had just started preaching. And uh, for 25 years ago, I just started preaching. Somebody invited me to their church. If I mentioned this pastor, you would know him today. So I ain't going to mention his name. So I went to preach. I went to uh, just new preacher. And then uh, I was invited to this church. And uh, the person that invited me to the church was the assistant pastor's wife. Okay. So she invited me to her church. So I go to the church and. It's a real huge church. Even 25 years ago was huge. I can't believe it. But anyway, uh, he invited me. The pastor invited me up because she told him earlier that I was a minister. So he invited me to the pulpit. So I'm sitting in the pulpit. He leans over to me and he says uh, he wants me to do the altar call. So I did the altar call. He said, I love helping young preachers and things like that. So I, I really appreciate him doing that. 
So he started preaching the sermon and everything, and I'm really sitting there like, he's not saying anything. <laughs> that's, what I was, that's what I'm saying to myself, because I grew up in a church where my pastor really preached. So I was like, they got all these people, but he's not saying anything. So I go to work the next day, because I work with the assistant pastor's wife. I go to work the next day, because I didn't see her in the church. I didn't see her. She was there at the beginning, but she didn't stay. So I said, what happened to you? She said, oh, I heard that sermon before. And she said, did he say, because she was gone, she said, did he say this? Did he say? I said, he said exactly. Like she said, I heard that sermon 25 times. <laughs> she said, that same one, he preaches the same way for the past 20 years. And I was like, well, why you, why you tell, why you let me sit there? <laughs> you invited me to the church. At least I got to pray. I got to pray for the, for the folks that had to sit there. And I could, I could imagine out of all the other members, that was there. I tried to do this when I'm here. I tried not, and I have never done this in 25 years. I have never preached the same sermon twice in the same church. Now, if I preach this Sunday, if the sermon I preach Sunday, I'll preach that a hundred different times, but it's going to be at somebody else's church. Not here again. Because I know that she was here Sunday, she was here, all y'all was here Sunday, and two months later, well, y'all ain't got nothing to say, so we're going to do, it's not about us. <laughs> it's about Jesus, and we're going to do that over and over. No, we're not going to do that. Because that's, when you get, when you hear a preacher walk up to you and say, well, I don't know where we're going today, but the Holy Spirit going to lead me. That's a person who hasn't studied the Bible. You got, watch this. 66 books to preach from. 1,192 chapters. And you mean to tell me you're going to stand up in front of that congregation and say you don't know what you're going to preach about. We're going to let the Holy Spirit. No, you didn't study last night or whatever you didn't do and you're going to get up there and try to tell them that you got to preach the same sermon you've been preaching for the past 10 years 100 times that they done heard and can verbatim preach it to you better than you can. That's not a good preacher. Watch what he says. That's not spiritual sight. And when we see that, spiritual sight is doing what we're doing right now. Breaking down each verse by verse. That's spiritual sight. Watch what he says. Last two verses. Uh, well, two more verses. Verse 19 and 20. Now watch this. Christ loved this church so much that he still offered salvation to him. Watch this. Go back to Revelation. Verse 19. He still, even in this dead church, even in this lukewarm church, he offers salvation to them. Watch what he tells them in verse 19. He says, as many as I love, I what? I rebuke and chasten. If God loves you, he's going to rebuke you. I can't tell my son and my daughter that I love them and let them do whatever they wanted to do. I, I couldn't do that because that's not real love. If I gave my kids when they were growing up everything uh, that they asked me for and not looking out for their best, they don't know what they want. All they want is to feel good stuff. They, you know, if, if it was up to Josh, he could eat ice cream every day. He could eat pizza and ice cream every day. All day. No vegetables. No nothing. But it's up to us to make sure he what? Eat some vegetables. Because he's he like, I don't, I don't need that. I just want to eat this. But no, we wouldn't be good parents. He might not like it. He, we wouldn't be good parents if we just let him eat what he want to eat. Or we just let him stay up all night, watch cable all night. Well, Josh, we got a TV in room. Here, here's the channel. I took all the blocks off. You can watch anything you want to watch. He 13. What do you think he's going to try to watch? So you know good and well, we got to monitor everything. This world showed you everything, so we got to monitor everything. I got all kind of blocks on my TV. So guess what? Well, Dad, I'm, I'm 13 now, and I should No, you still under your mother and myself. And until you reach a certain age where we feel you're mature enough, that my daughter told us, she's 20 now, but all of her high school years, she would tell us, how come I can't watch this? And how come I can't watch that? I said, because you're not mature yet. I said, it's not that you can't watch it. We feel that you're not mature yet. When you turn 18, 19, guess what? When you start watching that stuff, you're going to be like, well, this is what I was look, waiting on all this time. 
And I didn't want to rush into you seeing all that. You could, we could talk to you. Of course, you know, when she turned 18, 19, she was going to the movies with her friends and they started watching the rated R movies. It was the rated R movies. And then she said, you know what? I'm glad y'all kind of held that from me, like the horror movies. Like, I didn't want to see all that anyway. All the blood of gore, but I was a horror fan. Me, I loved horror <laughs> movies growing up. I, my mother could tell you. I watched them night and day. When I got married, I tried to get my wife to watch them. She said, what in the world? She said, I'm not watching that. I said, well, I'm getting my popcorn, and I'm going in the living room, and I'm watching Freddy Krueger, I'm watching <laughs> Jason all by myself. And until, you know what, she helped me because, number one, as the years went by, I started losing the distaste for that because she didn't enjoy it. Even no matter how I grew up enjoying it, I started saying, well, I, I, I have to really start enjoying some of the things that she enjoyed and we had to watch. So if I couldn't watch it with her, it just, it just didn't feel right. Then, then it got to the point where, okay, uh, this is not entertainment anymore. You know, because I started seeing that. Okay, why do I glorify? Why do I like watching people getting their heads cut off? I mean, so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at. I find that entertaining, and so I had to change what my thinking. But she couldn't try to. She couldn't tell me that in the first ten or fifteen years of our marriage that what I was watching was. She couldn't tell me that. I had to see it for myself, and until I saw it for myself. Then I was going to change. Not that it was going to send you to hell. No, I'm just telling you. It's not going to send you to hell because you're watching horror movies. What I'm saying is it really desensitizes you about how people are killed and murdered in the world. That's what it does. You watch too much horror movies, you can actually drive down the street, see somebody get uh, decapitated in their car in real life, and it wouldn't hurt you. wouldn't phase you at all. Because you're used to it. And that's what society wants you to do. Watch what he says. He says this. That was uh, verse 19. I want you, I'm preaching to the unsaved. Christ calls the unsaved church to come to him, get saved because he loves them and the whole world. John 3, 16, we know that. If they do not repent, he will what? Rebuke them, reprove them, and discipline them, which refers to exposure, exposing them, and judge them as sinners. He wants them to what? repent. Then he offers the invitation in verse 20. Everybody knows verse 20. Let's look at this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice um, and open the door, I will come in to him, dine with him, and he with me. This is the classic salvation verse that we use when we tell people about Jesus. Jesus is standing, waiting on you to do what? Repent. And when you repent, he comes in immediately. It's not next week. It's not two weeks later. He comes in immediately into your heart, and you now have a relationship with him. Let's close with the verse 21 and 22. I love verse 21 22. He says this, at the end of every church, and now seven churches, and we're going to close the whole seven church series and go to chapter four next week. But 21 and 2, he always tells you what God's going to give you in heaven because you've been faithful to him. Look at 21. To him who overcomes, that's everybody that's saved. You are an overcomer if you're saved. I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Go to the last page, page three, because you'll read the last one. I put a summary of all the things in the seven churches that he promised you if you obeyed him. Now, just listen to this. I'm going to read straight through them. You can read the verses at home. Remember all the other things. We went through this in all seven churches. If you're faithful to Christ and you live out your faith, these things shall be yours. Watch this. You're going to eat from the tree of life. You're going to receive a crown of life. He's going to protect you from the second death. That's hell. You will eat the hidden manna. 
He's going to give you a white stone with a new name written on it. He will give you authority to rule the nations. He will give you the morning star that is Jesus. He's going to give you white garments symbolizing purity and holiness. He will give you honor of having Christ confess their names, your names, before God the Father and the holy angels in heaven. He's going to make you a pillar in God's temple. He's going to write on you the name of God of the new Jerusalem and of Christ. What a mighty God we serve. If you just stay faithful as a faithful church. So a faithful church is the church that shows their deeds next week uh, by their faith. We're going to study. Uh, now we have moved from the past, which was chapter one. We just studied the present, which is chapter two and three. Now we're going to start studying the future starting next week. Next week is we're going to get into the future. He's going to tell you he was taken to heaven. And we're going to show you what he saw when he was in heaven. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Yes. 